At the world's busiest airports, aircraft take off and land every 60 seconds. Every day, hundreds of thousands of flights depart and arrive safely. But some don't. Suddenly I had this absolute realization that I was going to die. I looked for my wife, and she had been sitting on my right, and she was gone. I just got engaged to be married, and just when I felt I couldn't breathe anymore, that I had to get out, I wanted to get married, um, and I had to keep going. Just, uh, just waited, basically. Just waited to die. Not everyone has a fear of flying but we all have a fear of crashing. The airplane the greatest technological achievement of the 20th century. In less than the 100 years since the Wright brothers' first flight, this incredible machine has completely changed the world. But sometimes, the miracle of flight comes at a heavy price. Is this your worst nightmare? Trapped in an aircraft, heading for a crash landing. Just exactly what is it like to be there when things go wrong? In 1989, a United Airlines 747 with 355 on board came close to catastrophe when a massive explosion ripped a 15-foot hole in the side of the aircraft. Well, my wife and I were basically going to uh, New Zealand and Australia on a business trip vacation. We took off for Auckland, February 24th, 1989. As they climbed through 23,000 feet, the passengers settled back for the long flight from Honolulu to New Zealand. Jim McGee was half asleep when he heard a strange noise. I heard the buzz of the motor, you know, and uh, sat up because that wasn't a normal sound. And then I heard a thump, and my eyes went to the baggage bins, and suddenly they just, just disappeared, just gone. The noise Jim McGee had heard was the cargo door beginning to open. Instantly, there was a massive decompression. The force ripped away a 15-foot piece of the fuselage. Well, after it blew out, everything went white for an instant. <laughs> then I'm suddenly looking at the sky, or really not sure what I'm looking at, but realized that nobody was there and the side was gone and, and uh, thought it was a bomb. I don't know how to describe it. You, you just suddenly realize that you're in deep doo-doo. I mean, this is a serious problem. The force of the decompression was so great that eight people and their seats were sucked out to their deaths. It's like a disappearing act. It's just, there they are and there they're gone. Basically, the floor was cut right next to the aisle, next to where we were sitting. The captain put the plane into an emergency dive to a lower altitude where the air was breathable. The oxygen masks had been sucked out in the decompression. Looked for oxygen masks, but they were basically gone. So 
just uh, just waited, basically, just waited to die. Then I turned and said goodbye to my wife, which she didn't want to hear because I'm the optimist in the family. And she said at that time, said to herself, "Gee, if he's saying that to me, <laughs> this doesn't look very good." When the fuselage was ripped away, large chunks of debris destroyed the two right-wing engines. You become tremendously calm. I mean, when you realize that you have no control and you're going to die, and everybody says this, a real calmness comes over you. Your life doesn't flash in front of your face. In fact, at one point, I thought about my children and had good insurance and kind of smiled to myself that they're all going to be sassy and rich. <laughs> Felt good about that. The air crew managed to keep the jumbo under control and turned back to Honolulu. I screamed at my wife that uh, this guy was flying this thing and hang on, you know, we've, we've got a chance. Not really believing that, but at least we weren't tumbling and falling. And then we broke through the clouds right over the city of Honolulu, looking out this 30-foot hole. It's a beautiful sight to see Honolulu. And that's when I really had a good feeling that we, we had a shot at something. With just seconds to go, Jim McGee and his wife prepared for an emergency landing. I was expecting a, a crash landing. Told her that if we, if we hit and it starts to break up, to just basically get in a roll, and maybe you'll roll out the hole and end up on the runway. Incredibly, the undercarriage had not been damaged, allowing the crew to make a perfect landing. stopped, it was like this huge weight off your shoulders. And I just wanted to sit there and laugh. I mean, it was so funny. You know, I said, God, we made it, you know, just made it. And I, the last thing on my mind was evacuating this plane. I just wanted to sit here and enjoy it for a few minutes. For Jim McGee, the simple act of wearing a seatbelt may well have saved his life. There was a gentleman in 9F, and he was angry. Didn't get to sit where he wanted to. He was bumped down from first class because the plane was full. And uh, was asked to buckle his seatbelt because the seatbelt sign was on. And he basically told the flight attendant he wasn't going to buckle his goddamn seatbelt. And probably less than a minute later, he was gone. Nine people died that night. The National Transportation Safety Board determined that a faulty switch or electrical wiring in the cargo door control system led to the door opening. Over 10 years later, Jim McGee is still haunted by the experience. I'm a nervous flyer. I always will be. In the case of my wife, she doesn't fly. She just, she just doesn't think she needs to be scared again. It's a burden for me, but you numb it somehow. For everyone, the thought of such a horrific accident is terrifying. But for some, the fear is so intense, they cannot even board a plane. I gave up a flight to Hawaii, a nice planned vacation. I just started stressing about it about three months ahead of time and said, I just, I'm not gonna be able to do this. I got to the airport, got to the ticket counter, and as soon as I was in line, I began crying and just completely lost control over everything, and my body was shaking, I was hyperventilating. Feelings of panic, feelings of being trapped, those feelings washed over me in, in a way that prevented me from flying from, from that day forward. But some fearful flyers cannot avoid flying. For them, every trip is a nightmare. Larry Lucchesi is on his way to the airport. Since he booked his flight a week ago, his anxiety levels have been rising. I sometimes dream about it, um, and the night before I can't sleep. Keep waking up or not, I don't sleep at all, I just lay there. The day of the flight, 
almost a surreal morning. I look at every little thing as a sign that something's gonna go wrong. It's that feeling of doom. So if a flight's delayed, the immediate thought that goes through my mind is, well, maybe that's a sign that something bad was going to happen. How safe is traveling by plane? We are often told, statistically, that flying is the safest form of transportation. Driving a car is considered far more dangerous. But Mary Schiavo, an attorney and former inspector general of the Department of Transportation, has a different view. The uh, statistics on the safest form of transportation are like a lot of statistics, obviously uh, custom made for those who need them. If you want to skew the statistics and make them come out in your favor, then what you do is you measure it on a per mile basis. On a per mile basis, the plane wins. But the statistics are really this. When you look at the number of trips, the airplane and the automobile are about the same. In fact, in the UK, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents has calculated that per journey, there are 10 times more air fatalities than car fatalities. If each plane ride is even more dangerous than each car ride, perhaps a fear of flying is not so irrational. I think it would be an irrational fear had there never been a plane crash or had there never been turbulence. That would be irrational if I feared something that never happened before, but I'm fearing things that have happened. The public should be afraid of flying on certain carriers and under certain conditions, but the scariest thing is you can't really tell what those flyers and conditions are. In this country, only recently, um, it's been possible to get some data on the safety performance of carriers, more realistic data on uh, problems with particular kinds of airplanes. But when it comes right down to it, many accidents happen in bad weather. So you have a combination of factors, bad airlines, bad maintenance, bad government oversight, and bad weather. If all four of those are present, don't go. Larry Lucchesi's flight today is a short hop of less than an hour. I do try to use statistical data and logic to talk myself through all fear. But when you're in the situation, it's a little bit more difficult than just saying planes don't fall out of the air. I mean, when you're in turbulence and you're buckled up, no matter what you say statistically, the sensation that you're feeling overrides the logic part because your mind could just take you on a whirlwind. And the panic sets in and then there's no way out of it. On today's flight, Larry will be delivered to his destination by over 100 people, most of them invisible to him. He must now trust them with his life. You sit down in this tube of 300 people all facing one direction, and you're looking to the side, and you never see what's in front of you. It's not like sitting in a car where you have that 360 degrees, and as a passenger, you can say, slow down, there's a car coming. You don't have that. It's a lack of control. Larry has reached one of the most dangerous parts of his flight. There are more accidents on takeoff and landing than at any other time. Takeoff is one of the most testing times for both flight crew and machine. Engines are at full power as 300 tons is carried skywards. In October 2000, a Singapore Airlines 747 started its takeoff roll at Taipei Airport in Taiwan.
visibility was poor. A tropical storm was lashing the airport with torrential rain that night. The pilot had mistakenly taken off from a runway that was closed for maintenance. The runway he should have taken uh, take off on is five left, which is this one. The runway he took off from is five right. As the huge jet powered down the runway, it smashed into a crane just before taking off. The aircraft exploded in flames and crashed. 83 people died. At busy airports, there can be over 2,000 takeoffs and landings every day. It's vital that the runways are kept absolutely clear. At every airport, there are teams of spotters who are on constant lookout for dangerous debris. Mike Corlett is one of a team at Los Angeles International Airport. City 9, runway 24, left City House 44. Twice a day, the air traffic control tower give Mike Corlett the go-ahead to dash down the runway and check the surface. If during a runway check we do find something, it depends on the nature of the object. If it's something small, we can stop, advise the control tower that we found something, pick it up and continue on. If it's something major, a little bit bigger than that, we'll go ahead and, and close the runway, get it taken care of, and then open it up again. Mike Corlett now has just 90 seconds to complete his runway check. When you actually look in your mirror and see a 747 behind you, um, you really have a lot of faith in the air traffic controllers that they're going to give you a window of opportunity to get out there and do your check. It'll really get your heart going, that's for sure. It's a logistical impossibility to check a runway after every single takeoff. Yet, just one tiny piece of debris could set off a disastrous chain of events. Liken it to Swiss cheese. You buy a pack of Swiss cheese, hold it up to light. Ordinarily, all the holes don't line up. But every once in a while, you buy some Swiss cheese, and it does. And that's like safety on aviation. Most accidents are when several things go wrong, and um, usually there's a fail-safe. Um, unfortunately, sometimes all of the tragedies do line up. For 30 years, the world's most glamorous aircraft, the Concorde, has been the envy of the world. It's the most advanced civil aircraft ever built, but the supersonic jet is not infallible. On the afternoon of July 26, 2000, at Charles de Gaulle Airport, Paris, an Air France Concorde packed with 109 on board took off bound for New York. But within two minutes, the aircraft had crashed. All 109 passengers and crew, plus four people on the ground, died. The pilot had tried to reach a nearby airfield, but he had virtually no control of the aircraft. It smashed into a hotel annex, leveling it. The building was practically empty, but one English woman jumped from a room seconds before the impact. I heard what sounded like a plane taking off, um, and it just got gradually louder and louder and louder until it really was deafening, um, at which point the whole, the whole floor started to tremble, and I realized something was up. So I went straight for the door of the, of the hotel room that I was in, um, saw all the flames, saw there was no way out via the stairs or anything, um, and obviously just went straight for the window. The supersonic airliner could have been crippled before it had even taken off. Ongoing investigations suggest that as the jet sped down the runway at close to 200 miles per hour, one of its tires struck a small piece of metal that had fallen from another aircraft minutes earlier. The Concorde's tire exploded and debris was sent hurtling up to the fuel tanks. 
The tanks ruptured and the leaking fuel started a massive fire. All Concords were grounded while engineers designed new fuel tank linings. When an aircraft roars down the runway, it reaches a point where there is not enough runway left to stop. The fearful flyer is now committed. When a plane reaches its cruising altitude, most passengers are able to relax and enjoy the flight. The fearful flyer has to face the next challenge, turbulence. It was a very, very hot day in Spain, so the turbulence was, was bad. Uh, it was bad enough, though, that a lot of people on the plane were actually screaming, and that was, that was very disturbing. Being in that plane with that moment of panic, with everyone screaming and everything flying through the air, and not knowing what was going to happen and being pretty certain I wasn't going to make it, that really <laughs> shook me up. We had a lot more turbulence coming in than I expected, and I ended up having to brace my feet and close my eyes. Not that the turbulence was that bad, but by force of will, I was going to keep that plane up. In rare cases, turbulence can be deadly. This amateur footage shot on a 747 flying to Honolulu shows the moments after the aircraft plunged 1,000 feet. One passenger died and 110 were injured. Aircraft manufacturers designed their planes to withstand all natural events. Even the worst type of turbulence cannot break up a jet airliner. Manufacturers deliberately test aircraft to near destruction before a single passenger is allowed to fly. The aircraft may withstand anything nature can throw at them, but they all require thorough maintenance. Maintenance varies dramatically in the U.S. Right now it's in complete flux because in the uh, bad economic years, airlines just farmed out everything, basically the lowest bidder. And when you farm out the maintenance goes the control. But worse than that is the government has admitted they have a very difficult time inspecting farmed out maintenance because the inspectors can't be every place. Some inspectors have literally hundreds of facilities to inspect. In 1988, a Boeing 737 operated by Aloha Airlines was diverted to Maui when the entire upper half of the fuselage between the cockpit and the wings was ripped off. It's just like uh, there was no bomb exploded or anything, just poof like a balloon would explode and the top came off. Uh... A crack within the airframe had not been noticed. One flight attendant died, having been sucked out of the aircraft. But miraculously, the crew landed the plane safely. Wearing seat belts does save lives. Luckily for the passengers, they were all wearing them when the fuselage disintegrated. I think in maintenance, one person can make a mistake or not do something and it would be detrimental. And I believe that can be the case in any maintenance kind of situation when you're maintaining a machine. But when you're at 35,000 feet, suddenly it becomes a major concern. Some tragic accidents remain an unsolved mystery. In January 2000, an Alaska Airlines MD-80 en route to San Francisco crashed into the Pacific Ocean. The crew checked in 
advising that they had a jammed stabilizer and were experiencing difficulty maintaining altitude. Tumbling, spinning, nose down, continuous roll, corkscrewing, and inverted. I thought it was a remote control plane because it looked so light and, it was, it was, and unmanu you know, it just was out of control. The flight was so erratic, it looked like a model plane. Part of the tailplane had malfunctioned. The authorities are still trying to find out why. The last words of the Alaska Airlines captain were blue side up as he desperately tried to right his upside down aircraft. All 83 on board died. Sitting still for long periods of time can lead to a condition called deep vein thrombosis, where blood clots form in the legs. When a passenger disembarks and starts walking, the clot could start circulating around the body and reach the brain or the lungs. To make matters worse, the air we breathe inside the cabin can also be unhealthy. Unfortunately, within the cabin of the airplane, you're in an environment filled with germs and dirt, and it's, you know, one of the dirtiest, germiest places that there is. The seats, the tray tables, the blankets, the pillows, everything was blanketed with germs and bacteria, viruses, E. coli, pink eye, you name it. But it's the air itself as well. Um, there are no uh, specific strong standards for what the quality should be. Um, it's hit or miss. Uh, federal prisons actually have standards for air quality. The airlines are worse. And there have been many documented cases in this country of people getting tuberculosis and other airborne diseases on planes. But sometimes the main danger can be other passengers, passengers that endanger the lives of everyone else on board. A British Airways 747 was brought close to disaster in December 2000 when a deranged passenger broke into the cockpit and seized the controls from the captain. Fortunately, the passenger was restrained and the plane landed safely. This flight attendant was held hostage on live TV by a man holding a knife, making political demands. He was overpowered by ground security. A far greater threat to aircraft surfaced in the 1960s, when hijacking leapt onto the front pages of the world's media. In one week alone, in 1970, five aircraft were hijacked and flown to the Middle East. In front of a global TV audience, the aircraft, empty of passengers, were blown up by hijackers. To counter this new threat, the government established the Federal Air Marshals Program. The uh, Federal Air Marshals provide specially trained armed teams of civil aviation security specialists who are capable of rapid deployment worldwide. The program is based on use of minimal force. However, that force can be lethal if it's determined necessary in order to protect the passengers and crew. In this shoot house, the Air Marshals train with live ammunition. This is one of the few facilities in the world that uses live bullets in a closed environment. I can't get into the specific number of missions, but I can say that Federal Air Marshals are flying on U.S. air carriers internationally and domestically uh, every day. It would not be unusual for a passenger to have a Federal Air Marshal sitting next to him. As part of their training, they also act out hijacked scenarios on board an aircraft. All right, go into the cockpit. We got it. Open this door! Open this door! It's a hijacking! Although they do not use real bullets here, their marksmanship is closely monitored. The uh, firearm standards for Federal Air Marshals are among the highest of the U.S. government. And usually when we end up losing somebody in the program, it's usually for failure to meet the, the firearm standards. Ready! 
Since the air marshal program started over 30 years ago, there have been only two hijacks of U.S. carriers. I wish we could say that hijacking's gone out of fashion, but I think if you take a look at recent situations around the world, uh, unfortunately, hijackings still occur. It's our belief that the United States Federal Air Marshal has provided deterrence, that people who, um, terrorists, criminals who may want to hijack an aircraft have to take in consideration the possibility of a Federal Air Marshal being on board an aircraft. Modern screening devices at airports have also helped to reduce the risk of hijack. The latest generation of scanners can now detect plastic explosives, such as Semtex. But not every country can afford such high-tech protection for its travelers. In 1996, the hijacking of an Ethiopian Airlines 767 became the worst in history when it crashed into the sea off the Comoros Islands in the Indian Ocean. 127 people died. The pilot, Captain Leol Abate, was no stranger to hijacks. This was the third time an aircraft under his command had been threatened. I told them I would do anything they like. I was ready to cooperate with them. And I told them I will do anything they like. On board was the U.S. Consul General for Bombay, Pancho Huddle, and his wife. One guy came sort of running up, waving his arms wildly as if he was a uh, uh, bit crazy, frankly. And I'm not sure what he was trying to say. I thought he was a bit of a nutcase. And then I saw a guy sort of flitting up quietly and slowly up the way. And I said, uh-oh, this looks like some sort of coordinated effort. It must be a hijacking. The hijackers announced that they had a bomb and were taking over the plane. The bomb, I think, was sort of looked, looked like a shoebox with a few wires sticking out of it. Who knows what it was? This is my recollection. Although I hazy on this. It's surprising how, how poor you can remember things when you uh, think you're going to die. They said, fly us to Australia. I said, OK, I'll fly to Australia. But we have to discuss some points. They said, no discussion. As the plane headed south, Captain Abate tried to explain that they did not have enough fuel to reach Australia. The hijackers wouldn't listen and ordered him to keep flying. It was not my favorite four hours afternoon on a Saturday. I, you know, you were nervous, you were edgy, you, know, you tried to read the newspaper five or six times, you couldn't get anywhere. There was an eerie calm that as we flew further and further south, people wondering what's going on. My net feeling for the whole thing was very much that uh, I thought there was going to be a, some sort of very bad outcome of it. After four hours, the aircraft was dangerously low on fuel. The captain tried to negotiate with the hijackers one last time. And I told them uh, if they could make any it changes, and I showed them, there is an island here, we're way out of Africa, so this is your last chance to refuel. They said, no, we don't need any fueling, we'll go as far as the aircraft flies, then we crash. I said, if you don't want to reach your uh, aim, and if you want to die in the air, why do we have to kill all those innocent people? They said, never mind, we're, make, we're making history. Captain Abate was left with no choice. He announced to the passengers that the aircraft had now run out of fuel and he was going to have to ditch in the ocean. As the 767 lost height, Pancho Huddle and the rest of the passengers prepared for the worst. It was real panic, people crying, people, you know, praying in the aisles and stuff. And I started to try to do the obligatory, oh, dear, I love you, you know, yeah, it's been a good ride, whatever uh, sort of stuff. And my wife, who's a tough customer, uh, sort of waved that off and sort of, you know, don't, don't give me any of this nonsense. Just before hitting the sea, Pancho Huddle gave one of the hijackers a menacing look. 
I took off my glasses and kind of gave him a, a real hard look with the right eye to right eye. And my intent was I was giving him a, you know, uh, I hope you're near me in the water because I was, uh, I was a swimmer on the Junior Olympics and I'm going to put you down. The plane ditched. The force of the impact killed most of the passengers. The plane sort of hit the water, and it was very gentle, and I, I sort of breathed a sigh of relief. Whew. Oh, wow. Wow, this is going to be better than I thought. About 10 seconds later, it was like a 15-mile-an-hour accident and a 30-mile-an-hour accident. Then it was like a 60-mile-an-hour accident, and my last thought was, uh-oh, I'm dead. Very quietly, uh-oh, I'm dead. The next thing I knew, I woke up and I said, I'm alive, literally talking to myself. I'm alive. That was probably the most bizarre feelings I've ever had in my life. That one second after I sort of woke up in the water or the next few seconds, you survived a major plane crash. You're incredibly lucky. Captain Abate had managed to guide the aircraft to within 200 feet of a beach resort. I think I went through the uh, front windshield. And, uh, anyway, I, I just went out of the cockpit. It was a miracle. I was floating in the water, bobbing, just like a chipmunk in a lawn chair like this. I had no idea how I'd gotten there. I'm out there alone in the sea. Uh, there's some trash, coffee mate on the water. I'm bleeding badly in my hand and my foot. Almost instantly, I looked for my wife, and she had been sitting on my right, and she was gone. My heart sank. And then I looked quickly to my left, and she was there, also bobbing in the water, also with her seat. It's the same thing as mine, exactly. And she had never blacked out. I said, are you okay? And she said, I'm okay. Thanks to Captain Abate's piloting skills, lives were saved. But of the 176 on board, 127 people lost their lives. Everybody wants to focus on the survivors. It makes you feel good. But the reality is, is that most of the people died, and they never had a chance. All three hijackers were among the dead. The hijackers were never on my mind after the plane hit the water. Frankly, I figured that the one that I knew was near us, that I had bad vibe, was not going to make it because he was standing up without his seatbelt on. They got what they deserved. I can't think of a better way to say it. They killed 127 people. Captain Abate later received one of the highest awards that can be given to civil pilots for bravery and exceptional piloting skills. Larry Lucchesi's flight is just 15 minutes away from touchdown. Any feelings of relief are short-lived as he knows he has re-entered the most dangerous time in a flight. As with takeoff, the aircraft is working to its maximum as it descends, and the aircraft is entering congested airspace. When you have a lot of planes that coming into a relatively small area, that's, to me, juggling and playing with the potential of air collision. Also, how about down on the ground? The planes that are taxiing out to the runway, are, are they out of the way? There's, there's not a lot of time there. Contact ground 121.65 is cross. Air traffic controllers are highly trained, motivated people. They manage to guide thousands of planes in and out of crowded airports with rare mistakes. But with the ever-increasing amount of traffic, and in some cases, airports working with old technology, accidents will happen. Alitalia 622 heavy loss of terror. 
The most alarming statistic in aviation safety is the increasing number of runway incursions where more than one plane occupies the same runway at the same time. Runway incursions is the biggest threat on the U.S. horizon. Our airports are terribly overcrowded, handling more planes than they were ever built to handle. And unfortunately, the one thing that was supposed to save us isn't ready, and that's our new air traffic control system, which will be based on GPS, computerized uh, traffic. It's not ready. It won't be done until at least 2008, probably 2015. On a February night in 1991, at Los Angeles International Airport, an air traffic controller taxied a small commuter plane with 12 on board onto a runway. Forgetting that she'd done this, the controller then cleared a US Air 737 to land on the same runway. Just moments after we landed, there was this huge crunching impact that was terrifying. And a few moments after that, uh, roaring flames appeared uh, shooting by my window on the left side. The jet airliner had crashed into the commuter plane, lost control, and smashed into the side of a building. Thick, acrid smoke began to fill the aircraft. Staying under the poisonous fumes, David Koch made for the nearest exit. I decided to crawl down the aisle on my hands and knees towards the rear of the plane. And um, several people walked over me, stumbled over me. Outside, flames were now engulfing the entire aircraft. Koch was convinced he wouldn't make it. Suddenly I had this absolute realization that I was going to die, that I was trapped, there was no way out, and that I was a dead man. Trapped in the economy section of the burning 737 was an English television researcher with four colleagues. We were sort of getting out of our seats and making our way towards the emergency exits. Um, but it was slow progress because the, the aisles were so packed with people, there was nowhere to go, really. Tessa Chevalier realized the only way she was going to get out was to jump over the seats. I knew I had to hold my breath or I was going to choke. And I knew that I didn't really have very long then. If I didn't push forward and find that exit, I would die. Finally, she reached the overwing exit. I had a thought in my mind that I had actually jumped over all the seats to get past people. I didn't want to jump out of the airplane in front of people if there were people trying to get out. I was very surprised and a bit horrified when I got to the exit and found that there was nobody getting off. They were obviously all overcome. They were lying there in the aisles. So it wasn't surprising that the queue wasn't moving forward at all. Um, so when I realized nobody was trying to get off, I just felt my way out of the exit and jumped into the smoke. David Cope was still trapped. With one last effort, he staggered to the front of the plane. I saw a crack, a very thin crack of light. I pulled really hard, and all of a sudden, the crack moved open, and I suddenly realized it was the galley door that I had pulled open. I found myself looking out at the ground below me, flames shooting up from the underbelly of the airplane, and this incredible wave of pleasure and adrenaline came over me uh, when I suddenly realized that I wasn't necessarily going to die, that I had a chance to live. In his stockinged feet, he jumped. I stood there and watched this phenomenal sight with absolute amazement. The entire airplane from the nose to the tail was in flames. It's big, shooting high, wicked flames. Tessa Chevalier waited for her last two friends, Adrian and Dave, to emerge from the burning aircraft. We were all that sitting on the bus afterwards, watching to see who was coming out of that door. 
we saw Adrian sort of staggering out, falling out of the aeroplane. And we waited and we waited, and Adrian was the last one out, and Dave didn't get out. Thirty-four people lost their lives that night. The 12 passengers and crew in the commuter plane died instantly when the 737 crashed into it. 22 of the 86 on board the U.S. Airjet died. Most were found just a few feet away from the exits, overcome by the toxic smoke. I did feel guilty that I had got out and my close colleague, of whom I was very fond, had not got out. And I did think, you know, what could I have done? If only I'd kept hold of his hand, if only I'd said, come on, this way, then he might be with us still. But there was no guarantee that I would have got off going the way I went. I could have contributed to his destruction just as much as if he'd stayed where he was. With hindsight, the vast majority of air crashes have proven to be preventable. Maybe one day, there will be no accidents at all. If we can get there, there are wonderful things that literally would make many planes idiot-proof and also provide great margins of safety for um, operations, aircraft separation, landing, navigation, should make getting lost and getting disoriented a thing of the past. And they're all on the drawing boards and being developed now with the help of computers. We just have to hope we can afford them. Even if 100% safety were achieved, some people would always be terrified of flying. I'd love to think that one day I could get into a plane and see it as a form of transportation where I could relax and read and enjoy the film or the meal or see it as a part of the trip as opposed to the hell that I see it as. But I don't know that I'd ever, I think, I don't know that I'll ever get to that point. And for the few people who have survived a plane crash, what are the long-term effects of such an experience? You basically accepted dying, and you didn't. I think I'm a lot different. I think we're both a lot different towards our children. Uh, I don't think we sweat the small stuff as much as we used to. I know for a first month or two, I had that, that kind of like uh, feeling you get after you finally graduated from college or you made the football team or finally got the girl to say yes or whatever the things are that animate you. But, uh, you know, and then gradually got back to just, uh, you know, another day at the office. I, I don't worry about balancing my checkbook as much as I used to. That's probably true. I think it's given me perhaps a different set of priorities in life because I've had a moment where I thought my life might end. I've always wanted to make the most of life at the time. Not worry too much about the future. My emotions gradually uh, evolved into one of, of gratitude. I felt the big uh, guy upstairs, the good Lord, was looking after me. Why would he allow me to escape that plane when so many other people around me died? Uh, but uh, you really do feel sort of spiritual after you come through something like that. It's really quite a... What a dramatic thing. No matter what safety precautions are put in place, accidents can still happen. But however we interpret the statistics, the chances of dying in a plane crash are many millions to one.